electrons inside metals and we've looked at bound electrons Uh, we've looked at bound electrons previously. We've started looking at now at free electrons. Which give rise to conduction, for example, in metals. And we've seen that associated with these free electrons, there is a susceptibility guide. And this is called the poly susceptibility. And we've noticed that this poly susceptibility is independent of temperature and is given by the relationship 3 over 2 mu naught mu b square n over kb tf where kb tf is the Fermi energy and the corrections with respect to temperature are small so to first approximation this is the poly susceptibility of a sea of electrons and we've derived this result in the previous lecture and we've also derived earlier that for an ensemble of spin half particles for example electrons that are bound that are not free to move that are not inside a band we have the susceptibility mu naught mu b square n over kb t at under the high temperature approximation which is called the Curie's law so a direct comparison shows that this is temperature dependent, this susceptibility, whereas the poly susceptibility is independent of temperature. Now when we were discussing the free electrons, we did not take into account the orbital angular momentum of the electrons. We assume that the orbital angular momentum of the free electrons is zero. That is, they do not show any orbital motion. However, now we would like to include the effect of orbital motion on these free electrons. And this gives rise to what is called a kind of diamagnetism for the free electrons. And this diamagnetism is in honor of its discoverer, is called Landau diamagnetism. Okay, so remember how are we proceeding through this course? First of all, we looked at isolated moments. Then we switched on interactions of different kinds between the spins and between the spins and the environment. So we had interactions between spins and we had interactions of the spins with the environment. So with the examples include with the environment, we have the crystal field interaction we have the Zeeman effect, and in between spins we have the dipole interaction, we have the exchange interaction, and we have the spin orbit interaction. Then from isolated moments we included uh, interactions and then we went on to study what are called the free electrons. Now in free electrons we've already seen one effect and that is the effect of polyparamagnetism. Okay and now we would like to look at Landau diamagnetism. And remember, when we were studying interactions, we also included within this effect is what is called the diamagnetic effect. Because this is the interaction of the angular momentum with an external field. So this is a map, or a conceptual map of what we've covered in the course so far. Okay, all looks good. However, before I move on to this concept of Landau diamagnetism, I would like to quickly recap some effects in, in two important ions, which I forgot to cover when I discussed the crystal field interaction. Suppose we have these ions, Fe2+, and we would like to compare this ferrous ion 
with the ferric ion. First of all, we would like to see what is the electronic configuration of this ion. How many electrons does the d orbital have? If I look at the periodic table, which starts off from uh, the group 3 D, uh, the period 3 D starts from, from scandium. What do we have after scandium? Titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc, right? Okay. Now, Fe2 plus will be 3d6, correct? And Fe3 plus in the ground state will be 3d5. Now, suppose each one of these ions is inside an octahedral environment with cubic symmetry. So, what we have is uh, the triplet states, which are lower in energy, the T2G states and the EG states are higher in energy. And this is the crystal field splitting, some delta here. Now for the Fe2 plus ion, we have to populate six electrons into these levels. Now those six electrons, where do they go? The first three electrons, of course, go here in different orbitals. Two electrons would go here, and the sixth electron would go here. This is when the crystal field interaction is small as compared to the Kuhn orbital function, which, which means that this is the weak field limit. The other possibility for the same ion is the following. We have six electrons. The first three electrons go here. And the remaining three electrons would also like to go into the same orbitals and invert their spins. This is the case when this crystal field splitting is large. Large compared to what? large compared to the Coulombic effects. So this is the strong field case. Okay, for, and both of these are examples of the Fe2 plus ion. Okay, do you understand what's going on here? Why is this the strong field and why is the weak field? Now you have six electrons that have to be put into these crystal field levels. Now if you put two electrons into the same orbital, then those orbitals have increased electrostatic repulsion, so the energy of the system goes high. Okay. So if the crystal field splitting, this delta, is small as compared to the electrostatic interactions between two electrons. You see the energy, if the electron goes to a higher level, a higher crystal field level, its energy goes up because this is at a high energy, these levels are at a higher energy. So this does not look like energetically favorable. But if the electron goes to the same orbital, to the T2G orbital, it has to invert its spin nevertheless, but then its energy on this diagram appears smaller, but in practice, the Coulombic repulsion between these electrons is high. So there is a competition between the crystal field effect and the Coulombic effects. So if this crystal field energy splitting is small as compared to the Coulombic effects, which means you have a weak crystal field, then the electron can afford to go to these higher energy levels, to, to the EG levels, and keep its spin parallel in accordance with Hund's rule. So this configuration will result in an S equals 2 system. Because there are four spins that are pointing in the same direction. So this weak field corresponds 
to a high spin. However, in the other extreme, when delta is much larger than u, then the fourth, fifth, and the sixth electrons would not like to go to the higher states because that will increase the energy of the system by quite a bit. So the electrons who prefer to remain in the lower energy states invert their spins with respect to one another and they would live with this slightly enhanced increased Coulombic energy because the increase in the Coulombic energy is smaller than the increase that would have been accrued if these electrons went to the higher crystal field states. So this is the strong field case. And in the strong field case, you know that the electrons are in the same orbital, the spins are inverted, so the spin is lowered. So the spin of this system is zero. Okay? So you can have these two configurations. Weak field corresponds to high spin, strong field corresponds to the low spin case. And you can drive transitions between the high spin and the low spin configurations. Okay? So if you look at another uh, the other ion, for example, the ferric ion. Suppose the ferric ion is also in an octahedral environment with cubic symmetry. For the ferric ion, there are five electrons. So this is once again T, T2G, this is EG. The electrons, the five electrons, of course the first three electrons would go to the lower states. If you have the weak field case, In the weak field case, then the electron can afford to go to these high energy levels. Okay? It would not like to go into the same orbital because that will enhance the electrostatic repulsion. The, remain, the remaining one, elec one electron, the remainder two electrons go here. So the spin here is maximized and is equal to 5 by 2. This is a high spin configuration. On the other hand, if you have the strong field case, this is T2G, this is EG. In the strong field case, the first three electrons once again go here, but the next two electrons would like to go to these lower energy levels. They will enhance, no doubt, their electrostatic energies, but they would not like to jump the high energy scale. Okay? The spin for this system is a mere one half. So this is a strong field case corresponding to the low spin configuration. Okay, so there is a competition between the crystal field interaction and the Coulombic interaction that is always going on inside the system. Another way to look at this diagrammatically is the following. Suppose you have this is the triplet manifold and this is the EG manifold, okay? Once again, octahedral environment cubic symmetry. This separation is the crystal field splitting delta. Now you could have the following case. You could have Remember this is a conceptual diagram. This thing is the Coulombic interaction. Once again, this is T2G, this is EG. Now suppose you have four electrons or five electrons in the ferric ion. You put three electrons here. Okay? Now delta is larger than U, right? This crystal field splitting is larger than the electrostatic energy. So we have the strong field case. In the strong field case, what's going to happen is that the electrons, the fourth and the fifth electron, instead of going here in the EG levels, they would go to the two T, T2G levels and invert their spins. Because this energy is lower than this energy. And this diagram is the same as what I've drawn over here. Okay, I've just expanded the two degrees of freedom. The crystal field degree of freedom and the Coulombic degree of freedom have been drawn separately. So this is the strong field 
configuration, which delta is larger than the Coulombic effect. This would correspond to the following diagram. This is the crystal field splitting. If the Coulombic effects u are larger than delta, then the fourth and the fifth electrons would like to go to the eg states and keep the spins parallel instead of going into the t2g states and keeping the spins opposite. Okay, So this is how you can conceptualize the low spin and the high spin configurations. And you can drive transitions between these two configurations optically as well. All right. So this was some background which I which I did cover in the previous lectures, but I did not cover this in, in that much detail. So now let's move on to Landau diamagnetism. Okay, and the results are beautiful. And this topic that I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to talk only about Landau levels. This topic is the starting point for a huge variety of concepts in condensed matter physics. Several of these concepts have gone on to win Nobel Prizes. For example, the quantum Hall effect, the fractional quantum Hall effect, all kinds of two-dimensional electron gases, quantum heterostructures, they have Coulombic blockade effects. All of them have a starting point in, in Landau levels. And these levels were first presented by Landau, the Russian physicist in the 1930s. So now we've seen a resurgence of, of uh, of a discussion on Landau levels with the two-dimensional, low-dimensional condensed matter physics. So now, how do we introduce Landau levels, which would lead to Landau diamagnetism? Suppose you have free electrons, and once again, our starting point, of course, is the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian we know for a free electron is P square over 2M. I can take the potential to be zero. Okay, And if I include the effect of a magnetic field, then these electrons, they are spin half particles. So I can include the effect of the magnetic field through minus G mu B over H bar S dot U with B. Okay. So this is the Hamiltonian for a free electron. For a free electron, the potential is zero. Now I also know that this momentum operator, P square, is, has an x component, and a y component, and a z component. And I've also described in the previous lecture that whenever I have a magnetic field, this momentum has to be replaced by its canonical counterpart. And the canonical counterpart is that P is replaced by P minus Q, the magnetic vector potential. Since it's an electron with Q minus E, so this becomes P plus E A. So I have to replace this P with P plus E A. Okay. Now what is the magnetic field and what is the vector potential? Suppose my magnetic field is purely in the z direction, so my b is in the z direction, purely. And it's a homogeneous, uniform field. Now, in the previous lecture, I chose a, put, a vector potential A, which was given by half into B cross with R. Correct? And this was called the symmetric gauge. And if you notice, this was given by half minus b by b x zero. This was the vector potential, the symmetric gauge. We can choose any gauge we like. We have the freedom to choose the gauge. The only requirement is that del cross A must equal B. So to this A, we can add the gradient of a scalar, for example. 
Okay, so this is the choice of symmetric gauge that we introduced when we were discussing diamagnetism. Now let's today let's for completeness choose another gauge. Okay, let's now choose an asymmetric gauge which is called the Landau gauge. Okay, and since it's now this is called the symmetric gauge because the x and the y components they are on equal footing. One is b times y, the other is b times x. That's why it's called the symmetric gauge. In the Landau gauge, A is, for example, given by minus BY, 0, 0. So it only has an X component, for example. Or it only has a Y component. I'm choosing that, that it only has an X component. I can also choose this gauge. But now for to keep things different, I'm choosing another gauge, another gauge. Now I can easily verify that del cross with A equals B. You can verify this easily. So this is a proper choice. This is a proper choice of the vector pattern. It's a legitimate choice. Now with this Landau gauge, it only has an x component. So A x component is minus B y, and A y and the z components, both of them are zero. Now I insert this gauge, this vector potential into the canonical momentum. My Hamiltonian becomes, now this is an x component, so px plus ea, now a is negative, so it becomes minus eby squared over 2m. This is x component plus I have a y component plus I have a z component and I also have the spin factor remember for pure electrons this g is almost equal to 2 okay all right so this is my Hamiltonian. Now I can write the Schrodinger equation, the time independent form for it. Suppose my wave function psi, which is a function of x, y, and z, I factorize this. So if you notice here, the <coughs> pz component is, so the variables that are in here are pz, py, and there's a px and there's a y. These are the variables that are go that go in here. There are three coordinates. There's one coordinate y, and there are three canonical momenta: px, py, and pz. Now <clears throat> you will notice that pz commutes to the Hamiltonian. Okay, because pz commutes with this. Pz commutes with this, Pz of course commutes with the spin degree of freedom and Pz commutes, uh, Pz squared commutes with Px squared, okay? So Pz commutes with the Hamiltonian. So what I could do, I could factorize out this wave function into a plane wave in the z direction and a plane wave in the x direction. So I can factorize this as EI KZ Z EI KX X but then I need some function of Y because of the presence of this term over here. Okay, some function of Y which I don't know, which I need to find out. Suppose I did not have this term, the magnetic field was switched off. If the magnetic field was switched off, this would be zero. And this would also be zero. Then I know that I could write the wave function as a product of three plane waves. Correct? Product of three. I can, I can also verify this. And the energy would be equal to if there were no magnetic field, the energy would simply be equal to
nx, it will of course be quantized and it will be equal to h bar square kx square over 2m, right? Plus h bar square ky square plus h bar square kc square. Okay, this would be the energy of the system of the particle. Defined by three variables kx, ky, and kz. And if I plot these energy points in the k space, suppose this is my kx axis and this is my ky axis, then these points are all present on a grid, equally spaced. We learn all of this when we study electrons in 3D metals. This is a starting point. Likewise in z-dimension. Okay? And there's a proper spacing between these points. The volume of each one of these cubes is fixed by the dimensions of the solid. All right. Now we have switched on a magnetic field. Now you notice that pz squared is still there. There's a px squared still there. So associated with the px squared and the pz squared, I can write plane waves. But I can't do so for the y variable. Because the y variable is mixed in with this coordinate variable over here. All right. Now what I could do is the following. Now if I look at this term over here, what is the Schrodinger equation? The Schrodinger equation is the Hamiltonian acting on the wave function, function of x, y, and z, is the energy psi x, y, z, the time independent form. All right. Now if pz squared acts on my trial wave function, I will get an energy. That energy is simply given by h bar square kz square over 2m. Correct? When this term acts on the wave function, now this term acting on a wave function, the wave function does not explicitly include any spin information. However, we, we know that the way the, that particular wave function is will have certain in that particular quantum state when you have this operator acting on the quantum state a certain energy will result or that state will possess the particle in that state will have a certain energy and what is that energy? That energy is simply given by minus g mu b h bar, now we need to know the eigenvalues of s dotted b. Now b is along the z direction, so s dotted with b is s z into b. Now the eigenvalues of s z are m s h bar, and then you have the b. So the energy associated with this term is equal to this. Now we also know that g is to m s is one half. So this goes away and this you can have minus or plus because the spin could be alpha or beta, up or down. So this is the spin factor that comes in into the energy term. So depending upon whether the spin of the free electron is, plus, is alpha or beta, you could have different energies. You could have plus mu bb or minus mu bb. This is just the conventional spin term. The energy is is either plus mu bb or minus mu bb. Now we have to worry about what's going on over here. Okay, so we have to worry about this thing over here. Now if you notice this thing, if 
I were to write this thing in the following fashion, there's no harm in doing that. Let, I'm just taking the first two terms in the Hamiltonian, Py square over 2m plus 1 over 2m Px minus Ebby square. Now what I could do is the following. I could write this as Py square over 2m plus e square b square px over eb minus y square, right? Over 2m. All right. Now this is an operator y. Px over eb also has dimensions of the position operator. So what I could do, I could write this thing as, I could define this as y0. Okay. This object over here also has an interesting appearance. If I Multiply this with m, then I need to multiply this with m. And when I do that, I will notice that this thing over here is the square of a frequency. We've already learned about this frequency. This thing is omega c squared, where omega c is eb over m. And this is called the cyclotron frequency. This is the frequency with which an electron goes around in an orbit inside a magnetic field. As a result of the torque on the electron. You've learned about this when in, in the isolated magnetic moments lecture. Okay? So now if you look at this expression over here. These terms give us the semblance of something quite familiar. Py square over Tm plus 1 over 2 m omega c squared y naught minus y squared. This can also be written as Py square over 2m plus half m omega c squared y minus y naught squared. Now this Hamiltonian, what does this represent? Now remember that there's only p y and y variable here, even though y naught does depend upon px. <clears throat> so one thing uh, that uh, you will notice that the I, trial eigenstate that I've written is an eigenstate of px. Okay, is an eigenstate of px. So this thing which I've written over here, y naught, which is px over eb, its eigenvalue when when this acts on the eigenstate uh, on one of its eigenstates, which is trial wave function the eigenvalue of px is iota h bar kx, is h bar kx, okay? So, <clears throat> because px is minus iota h bar partial partial x and then you have e i k x x, this will give me minus i square plus k x x plus kx, sorry. Sorry. Uh, minus iota, minus iota h bar, minus iota h bar i kx, which is h bar kx, right? Which is just the momentum of the of that particle along the x direction. 
Hence, this, I can, this thing has an eigenvalue which is given by h bar kx over eb. Now you look at this, it's this Hamiltonian over here. Y naught has an eigenvalue h bar kx over eb. This thing. This is a kinetic energy term. And what does this term resemble? All of this represents a harmonic oscillator along the y direction. The only difference is this y naught over here. The potential is not at, the minimum of the potential is not at y equals 0, rather it is at y naught. And that y naught equals h bar kx over eb. Depends upon the magnetic field. So if we look at this potential over here, this is y. If I were to draw the potential as a function of y or the y axis, the potential as a function of y, some effective potential then the potential will be given by, it will have a parabolic form and its minimum will be at y naught and that y naught equals h bar kx over eb. Now the energies of a harmonic oscillator, they are all well known. Okay, we, we solve the harmonic oscillator in a course on quantum mechanics. Hence, what we've done now is we found out the energy of the system. The energy of the system will be this term plus this term plus the eigenvalues of a harmonic oscillator. This term, y not does not change the eigenvalue of the energy, it changes the wave function. But the energy eigenvalue does not change. Hence, the energy of the system of the elect the free electron in the presence of a magnetic field totally free electron is going to be given by the energy of a harmonic oscillator which is h bar omega into L plus half where L is some quantum number goes from 0, 1, 2, 3 just like any harmonic oscillator. This denotes the Landau level. L is 0, 1, 2, and so on. Plus, I, of course I have h bar square k z square over 2m, where m is the mass of the electron, minus or plus mu bb. This is the energy of the system, which is characterized with the quantum number L and can be a function of the parameter Kz. If instead of having spin half electron, free electrons, you have spin half particles, you will just put a G mu B M S here and then you will have another quantum number M S here. So this is the energy of the part of the system and it's quantized. If you did not have uh, any magnetic field, then this would be the energy of the electrons. But now the energy of the electrons is quantized in a different way. Okay. Nothing happens to this, this term over here. This term is still there, but these two terms, they are replaced by by the Landau quantization. This is called, this effect is called the Landau quantization. Okay, let's move on. Yes, by spin inversion, by, by, through the spin-orbit interaction, okay, by electric fields that are generated 
inside the solid and if the electron is in motion, those electric fields will appear as magnetic fields. So without external magnetic field, you can still uh, observe Landau quantization. So if you have these electrons inside, remember that this omega c is given by Eb over m. All right. So if I were to plot, for example, uh, okay, I, I will do that at the end. If you have this electron in a real solid, generally you would have to replace this m by the effective mass. Okay, this depends upon the band structure and the curvature of the bands. So this omega c becomes omega c star, which takes into account the effective mass. This thing is the now this is actually a tensor. So you have to take the component of m star that is normal to the applied magnetic field. And here you have to take the component of the effective mass tensor that is parallel to the magnetic field, okay? And in real solids, you also have to take into account G effective. MS. G effective can be different from 2. Okay, in real solid. So when you talk about bands and electrons moving inside bands in a real solid, the masses are replaced by the effective masses and these become tensors and the Landa G factor is no longer 2. It's different from, it may be different from 2. For example, in semiconductor, it's wildly different from 2. In indium antimony, it could be 50, around of the order of 50. So things change when the electron is in a solid and that's because of the band structure. Now what we would like to find out is how do these, how does the K space change when we apply a magnetic field. Now this is the K space in the absence of a magnetic field and in the absence of a magnetic field all the K states are populated up to the Fermi sphere. Okay. The volume of the Fermi sphere tells us the total number of electrons that are present at a certain temperature. That's what the Fermi sphere tells us. Now, how do these, how does, how do K space states change when we apply magnetic field? Now we have to look at that effect. Now what's going to happen is the following. This Y naught that we have over here. This tells us the center of the harmonic oscillator potential or the minimum of the harmonic oscillator potential. Okay, and it has units of length. This of course must lie within the dimension of the solid. Okay. The wave function the center of the wave function is here. You know the harmonic oscillator wave function, they are Hermite polynomials. Okay. So the center of these wave functions, the Hermite polynomials, must lie within the solid. Of course, this is common sense. So this Y naught is bound by, it must be between minus Ly by 2 and Ly by 2, where Ly is a length of the solid in the y dimension. All right. Now this puts a certain constraint on kx. Uh, <clears throat> we know that kx, since kx 
equals E B over H bar Y naught. K X, the values of K X are now bound. They there is a certain upper bound on the value of Kx and that value is given by minus Eb h bar Ly and plus Eb Ly over 2h bar. So Kx is constrained to lie within these values. Now the total span of Kx, total span of Kx, which is the maximum minus the minimum, this is the total range of allowed Kx's, equals this thing minus this thing, which is Eb Ly over H bar. Now what does this tell us? This tells us that the total number, now each kx state along the difference between two kx, this is fixed by the length, uh, this interval here, this thing, what is this equal to? This is 2 pi over lx, this thing. This is 2 pi over Ly. Likewise, in the z axis, you have this the volume of each cube inside case. This is 2 pi cube over the volume of sphere of, of the solid. So now, if this is the total span of Kx, and each Kx value occupies a length of 2 pi over Lx, the total number of Kx values is going to be given by Eb Ly over h bar divided by the length of each unit in k space and that is 2 pi Lx. Now what is Ly into Lx? This is the total area of the solid in a plane that is transverse to the plane in which the magnetic field is applied. That's the total area of the solid. Normal to the application of the magnetic field. So I can replace this with some factor A, some area A. Now what is B into A? It's the magnetic flux through the solid. And what is H bar into 2 pi? It's H. So this is E flux through the solid over H. H is the Planck's constant. So this is the total number of Kx values for a given Kz and for a given value of L. L, I'm not changing L. For a given value of L, all of these states for a given value of L. Look, observe, there's no Kx here. The energy does not depend upon Kx, it only depends upon Kz. So for a given Kz and for a given L, for a given magnetic field, how many Kx values are possible? All of those Kx values will have the same energy because the energy is independent of Kx. So this is actually the degeneracy of a particular Landau level. All of these Kx states are possible. All of them will have the same energy. So this is nothing but the degeneracy. This factor is nothing but the degeneracy. And I have to multiply this with 2 because there are two kinds of electrons that can go at each Kx value. Plus with opposite spins. So the total degeneracy of a particular Landau level Total degeneracy of 
one Landau level, which is defined by fixed L constant KZ is two times E phi over H. Now this H over E also has dimensions of flux. E, H over E. Strangely. So this is two times phi, the flux through the solid divided by a quantum of flux. This H over E is a quantum of flux. It's a unit of flux. So this is generally called the fluxon. Okay, and this is an important concept in the quantum Hall effect and in the study of superconductivity. <coughs> so the total degeneracy of one Landau level is given by this factor over here. Now let's look at what structure emerges in the K space. What's actually happening here? Remember that omega c equals E b over m. Now, if I were to draw a diagram, in the absence of a magnetic field, this is an energy level, and in the, when you switch on the magnetic field, the lowest energy level is h bar omega c over 2. So, you switch on a magnetic field, this is the lowest energy level. This is the L equals 0 level. Okay? This member is the energy. This axis is the energy axis. So, the energy of the system, this thing is H bar omega C over 2. So, the energy of the system lies here for L equals 0. For L equals 1, the next Landau level is here. And the separation is H bar omega C. The next Landau level is at a height of another height H bar omega C above this. All right? And this separation between Landau levels also depends upon the magnetic field. You increase the magnetic field, the separation goes up. And when I talk about uh, Landau diamagnetization in the next, uh, Landau <coughs> diamagnetism in the next lecture, we'll see that this is an has an important consequence, and it gives rise to different kinds of magneto oscillatory phenomena. For the time being, what I would like to tell you is that this is the picture in the k-space in the absence of a magnetic field. Now when you turn on the magnetic field, different kx values collapse. Different values of kx, remember that these points are actually finely spaced, they're closely spaced, there's an innumerably large number of k values inside the Fermi sphere because of the Fermi pressure of the degeneracy pressure. Now, if you switch on the magnetic field, the new structure that emerges looks as the following. And then I can first draw it, sometimes easier to draw, and then we can explain on the basis of the drawing. Suppose this is my Fermi sphere. This is kx axis, this is the ky axis, this is the kz axis. Now, in the absence of a magnetic field, I had fi a fine grid, which means I had a, a uniform continuous solid, because the points are finely spaced, so I had a sphere. And all the points inside the sphere were populated. Everything up to the Fermi sphere was occupied by electrons. And all the energies of the electrons, which are the k values of the electrons, are equally spaced. 
Now the new structure that emerges is dictated by the dispersion relationship that's written at the top. That's a dispersion relationship. The energy depends upon the Ks. That's the dispersion relationship. Now if you see how the new structure that emerges in K space is, it looks like the following. So now what's happening here, you get these tubes, which are called the Landau tubes. The innermost tube is the L equals 0 tube. Then you have the L equals 1 tube, the L equals 2, 3, 4 and so on. And you fit in as many tubes as is necessary within the Fermi sphere. So up to the Fermi sphere, a certain number of tubes are populated. And the electrons, the K values of the electrons belong to these tubes. They cannot be in between. They only reside on the tubes. So all of the electrons, now the same number of electrons must ex exist as they exist in this Fermi sphere. So the total number of points inside the Fermi sphere must be the total number of points on these Landau tubes within the same Fermi sphere. Because you're not changing the size of the solid. The application of magnetic field does not change the size of the solid or the number of electrons. So all of these electrons which were at finely spaced points, which were almost continuously distributed within the K-space, they now coalesce. Jam jate hain. They now coalesce onto these tubes. And the number of points on each L value, which is which defines one tube, the number of points in the kx dimension, in, in the xy plane, the number of points in the xy plane is going to be given by this thing. By this thing. This is the degeneracy. The number of points on each Landau cube in xy dimension is given by this degeneracy factor over here. And there's another way to look at this. If you project this structure onto the xy plane, you will get Landau cubes, right? The projection of the Landau cubes will look like circles in the xy plane. Now this is x, this is y. Right. Now you would like to find out the number of points in the xy plane that have now coalesced onto a Landau tube. So what you would like to do, you would like to take two Landau rings, you would like to draw a ring inside this, uh, inside the xy plane, such that the inner periphery of this ring represents the Landau level L and the outer periphery of this ring represents the Landau level L plus 1. So the size of this ring corresponds to the number of electrons that coalesce onto one Landau tube. So you're breaking up this stereographic projection onto successive rings. Each ring represents one Landau level. And Landau levels are separated by a unit of L by one unit. So this ring has a certain area in the case space. What is that area? That area is pi KL. Now I KL KLs 
plus 1 squared minus pi kl squared. Now what is my kl? I know that h bar squared kl squared over 2m must give me the energy of the Landau level which is h bar omega c l plus half. This means that my kl squared equals h bar omega c 2m over h bar squared l plus half. So this is my kl squared. I can cancel out one of the h bars. So the kl square that I've defined here depends upon l in this fashion. Okay. Now I can find out the area of this ring and then I can tell how many points are within that ring. Those points will actually reproduce, should actually reproduce the same degeneracy factor as I've calculated over there. So now if I find out the area of the ring in the kx, ky space, K by projected space that is pi k l plus 1 squared minus pi k l squared. This is pi. Now each k l is given by 2 m omega c 2 m omega c over h bar L plus half, now this is L plus 1 plus half minus L plus half. So <clears throat> this gives me one, 1. So I get 2 pi m omega c over h bar. Now this is the area. Now each point in the kx, ky plane occupies an area. That area is the area of each point is simply 2 pi squared over lx, ly. Right? That's if you divide the kx, ky plane into squares, that's the area of each square. So the total number of points within the yellow ring, which is a shadow of the Landau cube on the kx, ky plane, is given by this thing divided by this, which is 2 pi m omega c over h bar 2 pi squared into the area. m omega c a over h. Now omega c once again is eb over mh, this is e flux over h, this is once again phi over phi naught. And if I multiply this with 2 because on each k point there could be 2 electrons, I get the same result. So this is really nice. Let me go back to this diagram over here and explain what's happening. If I did not have a magnetic field, all of these points in the Fermi sphere, which were finely spaced, were populated. Each point had two electrons. So you had all the levels up to the Fermi energy populated with electrons. So this is the K-space structure of a sea of electrons at zero kelvins. Now you turn on a magnetic field. The K-space structure changes. How does it change? It changes in accordance with this dispersion relationship. The energy now depends upon a quantum number L. That's why the energy of the electron depends upon L, so it is these levels, okay, which are equally spaced because it's a 
harmonic oscillator. The separation between these levels now depends upon the magnetic field. Okay. In terms of K space, what's happening is on each tube, you see, Kz goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. There is no constraint on the value of Kz. It's only constrained by the total size of the uh, of the solid. Okay, it's constrained by Lz, the length along the z dimension. Okay, so there's a tube. There's a tube that goes all the way from minus infinity to plus infinity, but it is everything is enclosed within the Fermi sphere. So the Fermi sphere truncates these tubes. Now all of the electrons that were on a fine Cartesian grid in the in that K space the electrons, nearby electrons are bunched to case points are bunched together and now they all lie on this tube. And they, uh, they just coalesce onto tubes. They just gather onto tubes and in between the tubes there are no K points. There are no electrons in between the tubes. So this K space is now quantized in a different fashion. That's also quantized. But the quantization there is because of the finite size of the object. Lx, Ly, and Lz quantizes the k points because the wave function has to be periodic. The boundary conditions impose that kind of quantization. Here, the magnetic field imposes a quantization. That's called the Landau quantization. So now, all of those points have coalesced; they have merged together. Suppose this was a room, uh, and people were sitting in circular rings. The people which were at a certain radius, they all coalesced together and they form a tube. People further apart form another tube. Previously everyone was sitting in a Cartesian fashion, equally spaced. Now they form tubes. So this tubular structure in the K-space is now formed. Each tube corresponds to a particular value of L. Now the Fermi sphere can have L equals 1, it can have L equals 2, L equals 3, that depends upon what's the magnetic field. If the magnetic field goes up, then this Fermi sphere will have fewer tubes because the, the points are going to be spread out further apart. Okay, the degeneracy, higher field, higher flux. More points on one tube. So there will be fewer tubes inside the Fermi sphere. Okay, so changing the magnetic field actually changes the K-space profile of the electrons inside the solid. Another way to look at this is the following. A very naive diagram. At zero field, states up to the Fermi level are occupied. Now there's a certain number of electrons in here, which is given by the size of the solid. Now what's going to happen is you switch on a magnetic field, certain number of points are going to coalesce onto one value of energy, which is defined by value of L. And up to certain value of L, so this is L equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to certain value of L with the electrons, now all of these electrons in this region will coalesce here, all of these electrons in this region will coalesce here. Okay, so this is quantization. And on top of that, there could also be spin splitting because of the plus mu B effects. So each one of these levels could then split up into two levels which are separated in by two mu B. Okay, that's all right. This splitting is much smaller as compared to this splitting. You can check that. This is H bar omega C. H bar omega C is much larger than 2 mu BB. Okay? So this is the kind of structure that has emerged. A tubular structure in the K space emerges. And now we would like to find out the diamagnetism due to, land, due to this Landau quantization. All of these electrons that are now within the Landau manifold, which are described by the Landau quantization, have a diamagnetic effect. We'd like to find out the susceptibility due to, due to these electrons. All right? So I've uploaded homework number three, which is due next Monday. There will be some computer exercises that you will have to do in order to solve that homework as well. Right? And your uh, midterm is going to be on the 5th of November, Saturday.
at 9 o'clock, inshallah. Thank you very much.